Welcome to The Contrarians and to yet another Dark Horse album episode. The victim tonight, the 1986 album from The Firm, Mean Business. So without any further ado, let's get this started. Welcome to the Contrarians and to yet another Dark Horse episode. Tonight, this truly may be a Dark Horse episode. We are going to look at the band The Firm. Now, this was a band, Paul Rogers from Bad Company, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. We've got Tony Franklin, bassist extraordinaire. I just saw Tony play with Lou Graham on the 80s cruise in March. Stood right in front of him. He was phenomenal. Still has it. Chris Slade, the drummer, came together in 1984. They only put out two albums. Now, both of these albums, well, I think probably the first album was a little bit more successful. It got better reviews than the second album. But is it really that much uh, better? No, I wouldn't say so. Both of these records really charted very similarly. Uh the first album got up to number 17 in the U S and the UK got up to number 15 and mean business. The second album from 1986, which we are going to discuss tonight, got up to number 22 and it even did worse in the UK, but everybody knows that first firm album, but no one really talks about mean business from 1986. In fact, if you would have, give me some kind of poll. What's the second firm album? I probably would have failed, but we have a panel here tonight that can talk the firm and we're going to see if this second firm album is worthy. So we're going to look at the firm 1986 mean business. So we're going to, we've got Tate Davis. We got Butch here tonight and Martin and I at the helm. And in fact, I'm going to throw this over to Martin first to get us started and uh, what we're going to do is, well, we'll want everybody's rating at the end, and we will just take a tally and get an average and see how uh, Mean Business fares out. All right, Martin Popoff, let's throw it over to you. Yeah, so, I mean, this is almost like a dark horse band more than anything. I mean, these two albums kind of go together. We've got the debut was 85. It did go gold. Um, this one did not certify. So February 3rd, 1986. And as Grant says, it's definitely a super group because you got two super big stars in it, and there's only four members of the band. Um, you've got uh, Tony Franklin doing this this fretless bass uh, idea, so he really kind of sticks out in this band in this in this odd melange, this odd uh, assemblage of characters. You know, Jimmy famously, you know, Robert Plant got off to an amazing start. Uh, this was Jimmy's thing. Um, there was a lot of talk of drug issues and stuff around this time. There was the uh, the ill-fated Live Aid uh, get-together for Led Zeppelin. We uh, we got the Outrider album eventually from Jimmy, which didn't you know win any awards or be all that great. And he had some stars on there. He had Robert Plant. So so Jimmy doesn't really do much. Um, you know, going, uh, you know, ar around this time or, or basically ever, ever again. I mean, I, I think the best thing he ever did was walking into Clarksdale, um, as, as you move forward, um, bad companies broken up, but, but then they're back together with Brian. Howe. we've got Paul Rogers. He does the cut loose solo album, which is, you know, doesn't win any awards, uh, either. So he shows up in this whole situation. Um, you know, this album went to number 22 on billboard. Uh, UK went to number 46. I basically um, am just not a fan of this whole this whole situation. I mean, what I what I kind of like about it is the in, intriguing sort of uh, Jimmy Page guitar sound that you start getting around presence. You get more of it on in through the outdoor, um, and you definitely get it here. This is this album, the first album, and to some extent, Outrider. Um, it has almost become uh, to be known as the only actual trademark Jimmy Page guitar sound that there ever was sort of thing. I don't think you get a trademark Jimmy Page across, you know, those first six and a half Led Zeppelin albums kind of thing. Um, so it's this, it's this weirdly recorded, dense, uh, smoky, snaky, swampy sort of uh, 
sound uh, that you definitely hear on first song fortune hunter this is one that was going to be uh, part of that whole uh, xyz super group situation with chris squire so it could have become one of those but to me it sounds like a a pretty good in through the outdoor type song or an in through the outdoor outtake like a coda song um so it, it's kind of an interesting you really get jimmy's sort of personality on this um tony franklin's pretty pretty behaved so you're not getting that distraction of the um of the fretless bass moving to Cadillac, you get actually more of that from Tony. So he really becomes a big part of this sound. Um, so you've got kind of a Jimmy page signature. You've got the fretless bass. You've got very boomy, big drums where everybody, you know, any, anytime Jimmy page is in a band, everybody's trying to get some sort of a John Bonham sound. Um, but this is a really crazy kind of psychedelic noisy sort of song. And, and it matches Jimmy's personality. All the King's horses was a sing. It sounds like a bad company song, but you've got these dated keyboards on it. Um, Live in Peace, pretty cool song. Uh, it was also on Cut Loose. I think the better version is on Cut Loose. Um, this gets a little bit, it's slower and more dramatic and more kind of, yeah, just murky. Everything about this band is murky. You, you play this and you go through it and you just... You just feel a band dying and failing in front of you as you as you listen to this album. It's just there's just nothing, um, nothing that makes you optimistic or happy or makes you feel like rocking is going on. It just it just feels like this murky sort of mess. It's a weird situation. It's it's so non-commercial in almost every way, except except they, they do have sort of con conservative, you know, uh, conventional songs. Um get over side two you've got you've got a more kind of junky jimmy page sound on on tear down the walls again the fretless is in there uh now now the snare sound is is moved to sort of an 80s snare sound but there's but the drums are quite overbearing across much of the album they're really loud and boomy and the one thing that suffers i notice is that for some strange reason paul rogers feels like it feels like he's mixed kind of far back in the mix there's just all this weird stuff going on all over the place and paul rogers is kind of lost in this whole thing um and then you know next one you've got uh you've got kind of like a like a pop song again the drums are sort of too big this is dreaming um free to live another sort of bad company sound uh song sound um you know which makes sense um but it's it's almost like I mean, Paul Rogers is on it, but you're getting this sort of situation. Hey, Davey, how, how are you doing? Hey, David's welcome. here, so we'll David. get his views as well. Um, but um, but yeah, so you get you get nods to to Paul Rogers is passed on this. You get nods to just this obscure version of Led Zeppelin, -y Jimmy Page. Um, and then yeah, Frida, uh, Spirit of Love uh, starts with piano. So the piano on here is Paul Rogers. And, and I guess the synths and keyboards is, is more a Tony Franklin thing. You get the sort of orchestration sound on here as well. Odd, weird, weird sort of um, time signature on this kind of ruins the song. It, it could have been like a commercial enough ballad, but there's just, they decide to like throw this proggy thing into it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my, uh, my sort of overview of it. Um, I like the sort of hypnosis, uh, cover art deal. The title is neat, the firm mean business, and we're in a mean business, uh, kind of thing, but, uh, yeah, just really, really hard band to love hard album to love. There's just doesn't feel like anybody could, could sensibly think that there was anything commercial about this band. Um, and it was just expensive and full of these guys with big egos and just kind of went nowhere and the band basically broke up kind of right after so uh that's my take oh i guess i got to give you a grade yeah, give me well what would you i'm gonna give you a three out of ten. Oh my okay wow <laughs> well, I mean, while i'm putting the score in i'm just curious do you prefer the first album over the second album or do you yes i think so radioactive is kind of catchy on there um it just feels a little brighter all around it feels like everybody's a little happier about the situation mm -hmm. uh, a little more hopeful but uh still it's a pretty similar sounding album okay super excellent all right well i'm just gonna go the way i see it i'm just gonna go butch and then david and then tate and then we'll uh, finish it up. Hey, David, well, what I want when you do yours is just give us your review on the record and your score out of 10. And we're just going to compile everything up at the end and we'll see where it yep. ranks up so far. We're not looking very good, okay. but Hey, we're going to throw over to Butch Butch. Give us your thoughts on, uh, 
the second follow-up album from the firm well it's funny like in revisiting this record i i I remember having i got this um i don't know around the time it came out uh had a cassette of this got it for my birthday with a bunch of other ones and i remember liking it a lot more at the time I, i haven't listened to it in like you know since it came out really since that time so it was um my memory of it was definitely better than the reality of it now um i remember why i wanted this one was i'd seen the uh concert on mtv before this record even came out it was i think it was a tour from the first record and um the song that stood out to me at that show because i didn't really care for the first album to be honest with you um uh, radioactive was okay but nothing on that album it might have been the time the times for me i mean i was a hardcore metalhead and um so it was kind of like outside the box for me to something that i would have liked but uh, I, I mean although i like paul rogers and led zeppelin and jimmy page but uh but that concert they when they played they played live in peace on that tour and uh i love that song um immediately it it had like that uh it just had that it was that that uh that big dramatic ballad but not a ballad kind of vibe to it i i just like, love that kind of thing it's kind of like just a mood a mood piece kind of song um i actually didn't even realize that there was a version paul rogers recorded prior to it at the time on his cut i'd find out years later when i finally got cut loose but uh um so i got this record i mean and you know fortune hunter like martin said it's the i had the same thing written down it's to me i thought it was very zeppelin-esque um like i wrote down like a presence in through the outdoor kind of vibe i think the verse is strong in it but i think the chorus sucks on this song like it really lets it down it like goes from this kind of you know no, I'm not going to say not heavy or rocking kind of verse, but this more interesting verse, like into this like commercial. It does. It does. It sounds like it almost doesn't fit um, on that song. So that like blows the song for me. Um, Cadillac. I think Rogers sounds great. At, I mean, as always, I mean, I, I've never heard anything Paul, Paul Rogers sang on that. He could sing the phone book for me and it would be great. Um but the song's like, I think it's lethargic and lazy and um, there's like no spark to it. And it's it's very plodding and I feel like it's noisy. Like at the, at the year two songs into this record, I feel like it's very muddy and the uh, Martin said murky. And it's just, it's it's a tough listen in terms of just the, the auditory experience of it. And that's beside the songs themselves. Um all the King's Horses, I, re- I actually really like that song a lot. It reminds me of a song like um, like Bad Company from the first Bad Company record, except with like an 80s kind of vibe sensibility to it. You know, you get the yep. the more kind of like mellow, moody verse into like a harder hitting uh, chorus. I mean, I I like the song. I like the melody to it. Um, kind of weird to me, though, like on this record, like at this point into the record, I'm noticing a lack of like a lot of lead guitar work like this song no guitar solo in a song that is melodic enough that would seem to call for like one of those you could a great well i mean it's got the bass for a great melodic guitar solo over that over those those chord progressions somewhere in there but he doesn't you get like that half-hearted keyboard kind of solo in the middle of it and i don't know it's 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 odd to me but i think it is a good song um Live in Peace I Love. I wrote down Stone Cold Classic for me. Uh, and again, it was initially on the Cut Loose record. I honestly don't know which version I like better. That I like the Paul Rogers one, and then but when I A-B it with this one, like I kind of like the that this version is more dramatic sounding. It's got like the the more orchestral kind of stuff going on in the background as opposed to Paul's is a little bit more a little bit more stripped back they're both i mean it's a be a hard song to mess up i think it's such a great song as far as i'm concerned it's one of my favorites of all time uh, i love jimmy's guitar solo in it 
Um, I think it's like the one solo on the record that actually lives up to what he was capable of. Um, Tear Down the Walls, a Poor Man's Led Zeppelin, Bad Company mashup um, in the verse. I, I kind of like the chorus, but the production um, lets the song down. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, again, muddy and lifeless. Dreaming to me is like, <laughs> excuse me, borderline yacht rock. Um, although oddly enough, it's it's probably got Jimmy's best guitar work on the record on it. Um, that uh, that short solo he does around the twenty seven second mark is it it almost has like a Gilmore kind of flavor to it. And then from four hundred one to four forty, like the solo in there, I thought was pretty good. Um, but nothing stands out about this song other than it's kind of like this adult contemporary kind of thing. I don't even know how to describe it. It's not for me. Uh, Free to Live, I just wrote meh. Um, Spirit of Love, oddly enough, I'd listened to this record in the last year and on uh, Spotify, like I put, I clicked the heart on it. So I was expecting to get back to the song and loving it. And I got back to it. I was just like, it's just okay. I don't know. I like Paul's voice on it. I like Paul's voice on the whole record. I think it's hard to tell with Chris Slade and Tony Franklin what they're doing. I mean, I know Chris is loud, but the whole production kind of like Mars, like what's going on of anything. Like I think Mm -hmm. Roger's voice stands out as the, the best thing about the record. But again, I'm a Paul Rogers, like kind of like apologist in terms of his singing voice. Uh, Overall, it's an inconsistent record, mediocre writing. Um, there's occasional flashes of greatness, a couple great songs on it. Paul sings great. Um, I thought Chris Slade and Tony Franklin are poorly mixed on the record. Uh, the production's muddy and lifeless. And I, honestly, I, well, I think this record sounds like a demo uh, in a lot of a lot of places. They're kind of like almost like unfinished or something. There's just something about it. It's like the energy level is not where it should, for these guys. The amount of talent in this band, this record should be like off the charts with energy and uh you know you figure with all the talent between them and the 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 experience like that they wouldn't allow like it to come out sounding the way it did i yeah i don't know that much about jimmy's personal life or what uh he was getting into in terms of substances or whatever but i don't know what's going on in that band if it is just like barn said like a bunch of egos getting involved but that it's it's a it's a bit of a mess of a record. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I hate, I don't hate it as much as Martin does. I'd probably, but I'd probably give it like a four. And that's only because of the two songs I really like. Okay. Otherwise it'd probably be like a two. <laughs> oh, so let me ask you this, Butch. So do you think that, do you think that there's an album here of good songs, good performances that is marred by the production of the eighties? If we took this record gave it that 70s that classic bad company sound could this save it is there something here Uh, it might make it like a five if it was produced better or six i still think the songwriting is kind of weird like i said like on the on uh fortune hunter like the the like like i said the chorus sucks on that song it's like Mm -hmm. you can't you can't uh produce away a, a crappy verse or a chorus you know once you get to that point you it's just a badly written part it just sounds like a band that maybe knew they were done after the first record and but had a contract to fulfill and we're going through the motions there's i don't know how well they were getting just, along i don't it just, it, just know, doesn't make sense it's just yeah it's, a, it's on a weird, paper it looks great you know yeah i just i want like more great guitar work on it and I want it to sound clear and powerful and it doesn't. doesn't. <laughs> All so. right. Well, Martin's given it a three. Butch has given it a four. I'm going to throw it. And by the way, Butch, thanks for that review. That was very good. There's no hope in saving this one with Butch. Let's throw it over to David and get his. I'm going to. All right. I'm ready. I, I'm ready to hear it, David. So go ahead. Let's give it to me. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so it's hard to start on this one because I don't remember where I started. 
<laughs> I came in through the outdoor. No, uh, so <laughs> I haven't. Uh, everything that everybody said about this album so far, I I would I would echo that uh, historically until like about like two or three weeks ago. So I've had a I've had a change of heart on how I feel about this album. Um, I think what helped break that spell about how the album is is that I would always gauge the firm under Led Zeppelin standards. And when I heard of, first heard about Led Zeppelin, it probably was a lot similar to people that were alive there in that time. Like, what? Jimmy Page did something in the 80s? He had, he had a contribution? Like, you know, and, and Paul Rogers is in it? This is a super group? Oh, shoot. You know, I was just as excited when I first heard about it. And then when you hear it, it's always those expectations that put the break, like, right on where you... I can almost have a conversation with the rest of the internet about this album where like the headline seems to be this isn't what we expected there was these expectations so within the past few weeks I guess I broke the spell of that by just trying to remove as much of a history and and a, and a, and a ghost of Led Zeppelin at all from this album and just look at it as if it's maybe a Paul Rogers solo album and Jimmy Page is doing some like flourish I mean he's doing better more flourishes on this than than let's say Eric Clapton was doing on Roger Waters for a solo album. Like there's more of an influence, but it still feels, I think the problem with the album with a lot of people is that you're expecting the master to come in and, and sort of like show you all these new moves. Like when, when, when an athlete or, or a comedian for, for that matter comes out of retirement for like a decade or something. And what you're getting is you're getting, um, Alex Lifeson or Power Windows era rush where the guitarist is sort of uh, feeling apprehensive, I guess, and he's not meant to sort of like take over and be the real guitar god uh, type of person. And you're also getting, a uh, um, if you look at all of Jimmy Page's work before that, you look at Led Zeppelin's work, that's kind of just like a, a general Polaroid of 73, Houses of the Holy. What, what did they work on in, on, on in 76, Presence? So if if they never broke up and you were really looking at what Led Zeppelin would have become in the 80s, maybe they would have gotten mired at the same time as other albums coming out like, uh, you know, Judas Priest Turbo or Afterburner ZZ Top or Foreigner Insider Information. And 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 the list goes on and on of, of bands that could do no wrong by like 77, 79. And they all had their period of times too where people started getting pissed off at the drum sounds and the keyboards this one doesn't do a lot of those um egregious like offenses with the keyboards the only time i really can remember hearing keyboards is in all the king's horses and that sounds like a pretty sober like war cry beginning as uh, you know juxtapose up against like i don't know europe's like a uh, final countdown it has that opener like we're going to charge on, you know, all the King's horses uh, type of synth beginning. So it doesn't it doesn't fall apart into like um, like a, a very pop commercial area. They sort of still stuck by wanting to uh, work as musicians. And it, it sounds like they're trying to find something organically is what I'm trying to say, instead of kind of trying to copy the way that some other uh, big uh, supergroups would do. Like, for instance, I'll pick on Asia. They really didn't like reinvent the wheel they they sort of knew what they were doing and sort of uh was very aware of radio at the time when they were making it. this doesn't sound like an album that's like we're ready to take over the pop charts in 1986 and um fortune hunter and cadillac i like a lot i think the first side of this album is the strongest i think it's a really strong side it reminds me of presence something wrong with me maybe is that presence is my favorite led zeppelin album so when i hear riffing that sort of reminds me of that. Like it's been mentioned already, like Fortune Hunter has that type of elaborate riffage that Page was doing by the time of the late seventies in Zeppelin, you know, think sick again and all that. Um, so that's going good. Live in peace. I, I see pretty good reviews for people that don't even like that out al that, that, that album, that song reminds me of like, it's like the cold war. So it literally came out like a week after killer of giants by Ozzy Osbourne came out. It seems like everybody was doing something like that around that time but it, yeah it doesn't fall into a lot of the tropes of it being like this giant synthesized like you know spectacle 
Yeah. Cadillac, it's slow. It's like, you know, T for one, really slow. If you don't like that, it's going to bore you. There's, they're not, there's not a lot of reinventing the wheel on this either, but it doesn't sound like they're, how should I put it? Like, it doesn't sound like they're, they're sort of like taking a knee to the corporates and, and uh, as much and, and trying to make something that just sounds like, like an obvious pop single. Uh, second side, not as strong, but it's still decent. I don't have any issues with this album as an anomaly. I have issues if this was like the 13th Led Zeppelin album, but, but as far as Paul Rogers, I like the first Bad Company. This 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 might be the like one of my favorite Paul Rogers performance albums, and I happen to think that this one's better than the the first one slightly. The only one off that the only song off that album I really like a lot is Satisfaction Guaranteed, but um yeah it's just a Polaroid of where he was in '86, and if I can accept that as the palate cleanse before we start seeing what Jimmy does afterwards, it's not as it's not you shouldn't go running for the hills as much as everybody says this album being so bad. I think everybody should give it a shot. In a, in, a, in, a, in a way of not expecting Jimmy Page to come in as the guitar over, you know, overlord, you know. Uh, so nice. that's my two cents. Nice. How about a grade? Yeah. Uh, 7.5 out of uh, 10. Okay. Wow. Holy mackerel. Nice. Nice job. Otis, look at you. Wicked. All right. Seven, 7.5. Yeah. All right. Got it. Excellent. Excellent review. Top notch. Mm -hmm. Let's throw it over to Mr. Davis get his views on this one well my views are gonna echo what was last said by david except a little bit kinder um i i really like this album um i like it better than the first one uh the first one the issue the big issue for me is that the songs on it aren't quite as memorable except for uh living or except for uh Satisfaction guaranteed and uh, radioactive. Uh, um, and then the rest of it's enjoyable, but I just, for me, that doesn't quite hit me as much as the stuff on this album. So it opens up with Fortune Hunter, which I have in my notes, in my opinion, the closest that Paul Rogers ever came to singing a heavy metal song. Um, and as Mark mentioned before, this was written for the aborted XYZ project with uh, um, Chris Squire and, and Alan White. So I can kind of see where that uh, um, that band was going to go if, if they had stayed together. And I think Robert Plant was involved in that for a brief time as well. So I think, I don't know if this was written with plan because i think i read somewhere that plan attended like one bit one rehearsal for the xyz project and walked out of it after after that and i'm not sure if the song was conceived during that i don't know but um regardless uh fortune hunters uh, a really good way to start off the album great jimmy paid solo on that uh, I really like how it um, goes into a halftime towards the end, and it really builds the uh, the momentum into the last chorus. So Fortune Hunter is a really good way to start off the album. However, uh, we, in my opinion, the momentum is immediately uh, stopped by the slow, dirgy, boring Cadillac, which for me is just five minutes of jimmy page guitar nonsense while paul rogers talks about a fancy car that he has um it's it just doesn't really do much of anything for me um it kind of reminds me of that song on uh um bad company's desolation angels or not desolation angels burning sky album called master of ceremony which was kind of their attempt at doing like a dirgy moody song which just did not work at all bad companies was never that kind of band so anyway um cadillac just is like the elder stepchild of uh um of master of ceremony i'm sorry not elder stepchild younger stepchild of master of ceremony so cadillac doesn't really do much of anything for me all the King's Horses, on the other hand, is a terrific song. Uh, great memorable single with a great chorus. Great Paul Rogers vocal on that. Um, short, sweet, and to the point. Uh, really cool sentence on that as well. I love All the King's Horses. Live in Peace is a really great song as well. 
Um, maybe I prefer this one, this version, just a little bit to the Paul Rogers solo version from a few years earlier, although I do like that version as well. Um, great uh, solo from Paige at the end with uh, um, great support from, from Paul Rogers' piano. And I don't think that this would have sounded a place on Led Zeppelin comes in through the outdoor as well. Um, so that's just my opinion there. Uh, Tear Down the Walls is a uh, a pretty good way to open up side two. A really good riff from Page on that. I think it would would have sounded really good on Bad Company Straight Shooter album. Uh, provides a it provides like a good sense of optimism after the uh, darker stuff on uh, side one. And again, a really good uh, Jimmy Page solo there. Dreaming is probably, in my opinion, the funkiest tune on the album. Really good pocket from Chris Slade. Chris Slade and uh, Tony Franklin on this album as a rhythm section are uh, really, really solid together. Um, a great double time section in the middle with uh, with the great page solo as well. So Dreaming is a great song. Free to Live, again, another uh, cool riff from Page with a really great solo as well. Um, I really like how in the chorus, uh, Paul's vocals and Paige's riff kind of intertwine with one another, and I think that works really well. So Free to, Free to Live is another great song. And uh, Spirit of Love is a uh, really good song that reminds me of, it's kind of the second cousin, in my view, of Bad Company's uh, She Brings Me Love, which is the closing song off of Desolation Angels. Um, except maybe a little bit uh, more harder rocking. Um, I think it would have sounded really good on uh, Bad Company's Rough Diamonds album. Uh, really cool sense as well. Another great page solo. And uh, um, my uh, only gripe with it is that the gospel choir may not have fit <laughs> quite as well on a uh, a on a song whose. Uh, second half kind of goes into a um gallop galloping double time feel um but it, but it's a but it's a good song nonetheless so overall um like like what was said before if you were scared off from listening to this album due to the um unfairly negative reception that it has i would strongly urge anybody watching this to give it another listen because um there's something here and I sh and one thing I did forget to mention is that um I think that the stuff on this album is a good preview to the kind of stuff that Paige would explore on the Outrider solo album because uh the song Hummingbird in particular kind of reminds me a little bit of some of the slower uh, more melodic uh, uh material on this album um and uh Emerald Eyes, the instrumental also, uh, um, I share that same sentiment as well. So um, I, so overall, it, it's, a really, it's a really great album, or really good album. Um, well worth a listen if you haven't in a long time, and the rating for me that I give it is probably an eight and a half. Mm. Wow. You know, I just find it, this really fascinating, because we've got all the old guys are up on the top row and the two younger gentlemen are on the bottom row and everybody up on the top row mentions that eighties production, the murky. It seems like with everybody on the top row, that this production just absolutely is a, is a problem. And I lived through that era and I'm, and so every, these guys did too. And when this came out, I didn't think about it when it came out, like, Oh my God, that eighties production. How horrible. That's just the way things sounded. Now, David and Tate, you guys haven't mentioned anything about the production. Those big 80s drum sounds. You can look at this record and kind of look past all that. Does, does, does just, that... just to clarify though, Grant, like like yeah. the 80s-ness of it, I, I don't I don't consider it to have a real 80s production. I just I just consider it that the drums are actually quite loud on it and they're trying to do a Bonham-esque thing. And there's a, there's a, there's a couple spots here and there where they play with the snare drum and stuff and it's very reverby. Um, but other than that, it, it just feels like a, like, like a, who, who, who called this a demo? Was that you, Butch? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a seventies demo. 
Um, it's it's really murky and weird. So it's pretty analog. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not so much the production, uh, I, I would say. Uh, I just I want to add one more thing that, you know, Paul Rogers, after he leaves Bad Company, we get cut loose with that horrible album cover. And it's not not a very well loved album. We get the firm. We get the law eventually, which is like a ridiculous, you know, <laughs> try it at sort of a super group thing. A lot of covers on it. It's really dull. And then we get the Queen album. Right. So so there just hasn't been a lot of good. And he does a lot of covers, things and bluesy things. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, Paul Rogers has has almost fallen into the Jimmy Page trap of, <laughs> uh, of you know, after the 70s. There's there's not a lot of there's not a lot of sunshine in that catalog as we go on so i'll leave it at that sad but true <laughs> so i don't know there's still our 80s tendencies on this record let you can't escape it but it seems like the younger younger gentleman can uh, really look at past it and grab onto something maybe i don't know could be a generational thing so we've yeah, got I don't know. The, the production just never uh just never bothered me all that much um even the murkiness not really, no. As as a drummer myself, I can appreciate uh, Chris Slade's drums kind of being up in up front in the mix. So, but it was of the time. Was, yeah. yeah. So you know what you know. It's I'll, I'll you agree know. with Martin. I'll agree with Martin that the snare might be gated in in certain oh. spots. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's gated. Come and on, Chris Slade. I I don't know if I'm I'm agreeing with you on that dreaming saying he's in a good funky pocket there. To me, that sounds really clunky. Like that whole mm -hmm. that whole drug the whole weird time signature thing on that doesn't seem to. It, it seems like they should have straightened that song out and just made it a straight four four. It's it's a little weird. And then I noticed that on Spirit of Love, he goes really crazy and plays a lot, and it's really cool to hear that as a drummer. But it doesn't yeah. match the music. The music is again yeah. so weak. And so little going on, and Chris Slade is like taking over, right? Sort of thing. So it's, it's and, really erratic. It's everybody's erratic on it, right? And it just sounds really weird with that gospel choir on yeah. Spirit of Love. I, I, that was like the one kind of question that I had. Like, I literally have in my notes, like, gospel choir. Well, like, blame Foreigner for that. Yeah. Yeah. Why did they feel the need to put that on there? Foreigner. I, yeah. Foreigner. Yeah. Probably. Big hit. Hey man, we're trying uh, to get a hit. Yeah. All right. So we've got a three, we've got a, a four, a 7.5, and an 8.5. So we tally that. Oh, oh, oh. Looks like a six to me. Yeah. 5.75, gentlemen. Okay. As the official stamper of what is a Dark Horse <laughs> record, say I want to have a graphic that I can put a stamp on the screen. I am going to say that this does not qualify. This is just some run-of-the-mill record that no wonder I haven't listened to it since 1986. Um, though we have a couple of fans of the record, but I, I don't think it stands up. I think it just should stay right where it is in its position in time. Would have made a good 45. Good seven inch release. <laughs> All the King's Horses, just put that out and a B side. Live in peace on mm -hmm. one release. That'd be good for me. Uh, well, that's why we do these Dark Horse episodes. You never know what you're going to get. And unfortunately, I don't think this one makes the grade. I'm sorry, David. I'm sorry, Tate. Nothing against you two gentlemen. You did a fine <laughs> argument, but okay. yeah, it just kind of lays there. So I don't know. I guess we can wrap this dog up. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, Butch, David, Tate, Martin. Hey, thanks for come. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for joining this conversation. Uh, up next, plenty of things down the tube. If you'd like to be on these contrarian discussions, we do have a Patreon that you can join. We throw out topics every month. You can be a part of these discussions if you feel the need we'd love to have you also we have a kofi if you'd like to buy us a pint or a cup of coffee we take that we also like donations too so feel free throw money just throw money like todd rungren said so on that note yes the firm mm -mm. no way not a dark horse all right everybody we'll see you on the next one and All have right. a good night thanks guys see you Talk gentlemen you thanks so much thanks again see you guys yeah.